Hi there again, uh, Timothy Dolan, and uh, this episode is going to uh, deal with uh, explicitly a future studies course, uh, the last one that I taught at uh, Texas A&M International University. Uh, I've only had the opportunity to teach an explicit future studies course about five times over uh, my career, uh, starting at the Catholic University of Korea, uh, where I developed full-on courses. This one is an abbreviated one that uh, was taught over a summer. Uh, hopefully it has some content that might be of use. Uh, you be the judge, I think there are bits that might be appropriated and uh, you're certainly welcome to do so. Uh, as always, uh, any comments would be welcome. And uh, let's go ahead. Okay, so uh, this is a, a sample future studies course that I did in the summer of 2018 at Texas A&M University, uh, International University, Laredo, Texas. And uh, consider it a kind of, um, I don't know, call it a junkyard where you can pull various pieces out and perhaps incorporate into whatever variation of future studies course. Uh, you might be contemplating. Uh, so uh, let's go ahead and proceed to our next slide. This was an introductory course, an upper division uh, undergraduate course, and the uh, early influences for me uh, are shown in this uh, introduction. Uh, this was set up over a 10-session period. Uh, the sessions actually went uh, in three-hour increments, so they're actually lengthy, uh, but 10 in total. Um, so, of course, you want to get into what future studies is and what it is not. And uh, what I do, and I don't think this is all that exotic, is get into the early influences. And uh, it does go back quite a ways and uh, with an emphasis on it as a formal study uh, from a theoretical viewpoint, but uh, still formal academic study. Uh, you'll see, of course, it's a, a mix of some classical philosophers and uh, also some um, classic uh, science fiction writers. Uh, many of these have continued to be an influence in my own work. Uh, most recently, I've been uh, keying in on some of the work of Buckminster Fuller, who is, uh, of course, an old long-standing uh, uh, architect and design person, as well as a futurist. Uh, all of them are uh, useful resources in my view. In my uh, second session, I uh, do play pay homage, uh, tribute to my mentor, as Dr. Jim Dater at the University of Hawaii, a very powerful figure in our, in our field. And uh, so here I look at some of his work, which I have retained, uh, including a uh, piece that he did on how to think usefully about the future. This was a talk, so it's actually a videotape talk uh, that I still find uh, very useful as a uh, an introduction and orientation uh, to the field, uh, as well as Dater's Three Laws of Future Studies. Uh, again, uh, I guess we can regard this as uh, classic work at this point as the um, discipline has proceed and grow preceded and grown and evolved uh, from these early roots. Proceeding with the uh, Again, call it a tribute to the Manoa School of Future Studies. Uh, there is the review of the four basic futures uh, found therein, as well as um, a full half session on transhumanism, which is, uh, again, an area that I have an early and abiding interest in. Uh, so it does tend to uh, range beyond perhaps a, uh, a full generation forward, but it's one that I think we should be anticipating. Uh, and I think there's increasing currency and certainly a growing literature on this field. 
and uh, a growing number of, I'll call them, adherents to the transhumanist, uh, call it agenda. Um, but we do, in, in my particular lecture on this, which I have developed again over many years, uh, we review the six paths of what I call the post-homo sapiens futures. I often call it post-saps for short. But uh, we look at robotics or prosthetics, which is the most familiar, most accessible form of uh, transhumanism. Uh, and then moving on to, I think, more profound um, enhancements and uh, modifications, including drugs and pharmaceuticals, uh, genetic engineering, of course, space colonization, and uh, one that I still hold is uh, one where the terrestrial form is absolutely going to be altered uh, to an unrecognizable form. And uh, so it's the one thing that science fiction, I think I've mentioned before, uh, consistently gets wrong about what happens when we're in space. Uh, we're not going to look like Jean-Luc Picard. I'm pretty sure of that. Um, virtual reality. And uh, then finally, nanotechnology. And uh, I should mention, even within the form of nanotechnology, uh, the idea that, you say, combined with space colonization, uh, I would say there's a real prospect that should we uh, go that route, literally, we will uh, necessarily probably have to shrink, uh, perhaps to a microbial form. I mean, that's not something that uh, we may be used to, but it's something that makes perfect sense when one thinks about uh, space travel and how one is going to get over uh, enormous distances, no matter how fast we go, even as we perhaps approach the speed of light. But uh, it's fun. It's a fun lecture, uh, richly uh, illustrated and one that can, again, engage the participants. Always something we want to do. And we come to uh, this uh, concept of used futures, uh, and it is an area that has been uh, well described uh, by colleagues and uh, not at all adverse to appropriating their work and incorporating it into uh, my own coursework. We all do that, and we all should. Uh, so we talk about this idea of the used future. So there is the 1939 General Motors World's Fair exhibition film, which is uh, still available on YouTube. So it gives you this amazing uh, insight into a 1939 vision of a future. Uh, there is a, a wonderful illustration. It's an ad, a full page ad from Esso, now Exxon, but back in the early 60s, there was a center page ad where they uh, bragged, in essence, about uh, the power of fossil fuels to melt glacials. Highly ironic now. And of course, we have the Jetsons, which was a, a spoof uh, of, uh, of futures, but still one where uh, we can uh, be both be entertained and uh, consider how those uh, quaint uh, notions of modernity are simply projected forward with very little change in uh, in, in the culture itself, which is uh, I think we can all agree is, is foolish and best. Um, futurists as Cassandra's, for those, again, it's a survey course, but I do point out, uh, at least in passing, that uh, the role of futurist is likely to be one of uh, ultimate frustration, uh, as no one is likely to take one seriously, uh, as, as certainly as an academic in the field. Uh, and as a result, uh, even when you're right, uh, you fail. So what can you do? It's not a, uh, a great uh, discipline for uh, certainly quick reward, uh, the best you can hope for is vindication, and that may come post-mortem, so not a great one. It's right there with uh, with artists who usually don't become famous until they're dead. Uh, now, we did 
know. I recall this uh, very well because in 1984 I was a uh, graduate student taking several courses in, in the field. So climate change was already well known and it was well known globally because I've subsequently uh, listened to a lecture of a uh, former Soviet, a Russian Soviet era uh, climatologist who knew full well about climate change uh, within the Soviet bubble. And uh, ironically, when they had uh, reported their findings of, of global warming, uh, that prospect was met uh, with great joy by uh, the Soviet uh, central planets because that would have opened up S Siberia in their minds. This was a wonderful vehicle for exploitation of uh, their vast natural resources which were largely locked up in the permafrost. Um, so you had that uh, cyber insecurity. We certainly knew about that. It was well before Y2K and all that stuff. But uh, there was already issues about um, just how far we could take information without it spilling out uh, in unintended ways. Uh, pandemics. Uh, the pandemics have always been with us. Uh, so it's in the news now. But uh, it's a very juicy and, and central topic, I believe, in any even introductory course in future studies uh, in terms of uh, massive uh, quantum change that can occur within a society uh, or a planet, for that matter. Uh, food security and ergonomics, of all things, uh, was these were topics that were uh, discussed. The, uh, uh, one colleague was very, very, very uh, keen on basically individual household level uh, self-sufficient uh, food production uh, devices, uh, which you know is a great vision, and uh, we'll see where all that goes. Could go someplace eventually for us. Uh, but these are the areas that uh, again we've, we've long known about. So uh, we can review a literature that uh, attempted prediction but got certain things wrong, which, of course, we learned from those failures. Uh, so it's, it's good. It's good to uh, have that available for review. Then there's the concept of technological determinism and cycle theories of uh, of futures, uh, the idea that things uh, proceed in a cycle or perhaps uh, metaphorically as a, as a season. And uh, we explore those, uh, those thoughts, those theories, those speculations. Uh, certainly in the case of uh, technological determinism, you know, it's the, uh, we shape our tools and thereafter our tools shape us uh, meme. And, uh, there's much to that. Uh, there have been clear-cut transformations that have occurred with new technologies uh, that we are still uh, contending with and uh, both incorporated and now uh, dealing with uh, some of the consequences. Um, the, uh, the unintended consequences, the technological fixes that come with that, which often lead to other unintended consequences, and so it goes. Uh, the cycle theories of institutional behavior is, is an interesting one. How uh, we can get uh, the rise and fall of uh, organizations, of industries, of cultures, of societies uh, over time, and uh, there's a bit of a flow to that, which is recognizable, certainly within common historical narrative. Uh, so it's, it's well worth uh, a review. Um, so we look at those cycle theories, and uh, I also get into, uh, and this comes from William Irwin Thompson. Uh, back in the early 90s, he wrote a book called Pacific Shift, and uh, one of the chapters in that book uh, was broadly anthropological. Uh, so we looked at riverine societies, that then eventually shifted to the Mediterranean cultural ecology, uh, which in accelerated fashion uh, moved to the Atlantic 
industrial cultural economy. Uh, so it was the London, Paris, New York uh, kind of uh, axis, if you will. Uh, and then finally to the Pacific shift, which we are in the midst of uh, and perhaps uh, now evolving out of. Uh, but it's, it's a useful way of provi providing some scale to uh, cultural change, societal change, and how things have accelerated because that riverine uh, cultural ecology lasted for millennia. The Mediterranean cultural ecology lasted for several centuries. The Atlantic cultural ecology lasted for, at best, 200 years. And the Pacific cultural ecology uh, appears to be uh, playing itself out in an even faster cycle. So we can look at that as, uh, as instructional. So as a, as a course and, and or workshop, uh, you do want to, of course, engage participants dialogically and uh, have them you know, do the, both readings, uh, review of lecture, and uh, uh, the incorporation of their own thought into, um, into discussion. Uh, so uh, I, would, I would urge, of course, uh, all instructors to try to follow that uh, overall uh, model and hardly anything exotic. Um, so yeah, there is discussion, uh, review of that uh, concept of technological determinism because it's it's interesting to see what they come up with. You know, you want to spark a creative uh, element, uh, impulse uh, with your participants. You know, uh, future studies is enriched by uh, creative thought by. Uh, Again, maybe wild speculation, but you want to get there. I also get into um, dialectical analysis, which is an area that I've begun to develop and have written on and published on uh, in various ways. I, I forgot to mention ephemeralization, which again it happens to harken back to my interest in Buckminster Fuller. Uh, he came up with that term back in 1945, the idea that uh, and it dovetails with technological innovation that uh, we begin to do more and more with less and less, meaning the uh, literal power to weight ratio of, of technologies tends to shrink and expand. Uh, so uh, it's, an, it's an important area to look at because it, it seems to be inevitable. Uh, one only has to look at that tried and true metaphor of the uh, mainframe computer uh, and now you know through several iterations uh, now down to uh, the size of one's smartphone that holds infinitely more uh, data and computational power than any mainframe ever did say a mere 50 years ago uh, endless examples of that and it's good to have them uh, look at that look at it what has ephemeralized over the years. I made that other reference in a previous session about how libraries went from you know, massive collections of books and then with their subscription services tried to you know, jam everything into microfiche, which was a marvelous uh, way of saving space, but of course was then leapfrogged by digital uh, uh, innovations. And, uh, and, and hence we have dusty usually basement rooms of microfiche uh, sections within a library that a few, if anybody, ever goes to anymore, even though they are rich um, archives of, uh, of, of information. Um, so, so we look at all of that. Uh, we, we, we review it over, particularly in, in a roughly halfway point within a course. And as I mentioned, dialectical analysis. So you, you play with this idea uh, because it frames, and this is what I've written on. Uh, dialectical analysis allows us to frame our speculation. There may be infinite possibilities, but they usually occur within uh, a boundary. Uh, the one I, the one I'm most familiar with, and the one I use most often, is within the field of public policy, which was really my uh, cho chosen kind of broader field that I'm 
contextualized in, and that is that you can look at public policy as bounded by, on the one hand, doing nothing. Doing nothing can be a policy. Uh, and then on the extreme other side is kill them all. And then, of course, the challenge is to come up with the perhaps the, the, the optimal pathway between those two poles. So dialectical analysis works as a framing mechanism uh, for me. So we go ahead and get into that. It's, a, it's an indulgence, uh, an area of personal interest, and one that you should be able to communicate clearly, uh, even within the context of a, uh, uh, an introductory course. We have marvelous talent uh, within our field, and it, is, it behooves us to uh, tap into that and uh, display it uh, for uh, broader discussion and absorption uh, by participants. So in, uh, in the latter portions of, of uh, this particular course, I get into mapping, uh, anticipation, these concepts, uh, timing the future, deepening the future, creating alternatives and transforming futures, which is a uh, mainstay in our, in our field and uh, one in which colleagues have contributed marvelous work uh, so you can uh, go through some of that literature and pick out some of the best examples and uh, put that stuff on display uh, and, and hopefully in a coherent way uh, in digestible chunks. But uh, things that are, uh, are extremely important components to the field uh, for anybody who is uh, contemplating uh, a futurist uh, point of view uh, uh, or you know, seeking to get uh, some orientation as to uh, what they may be able to do in terms of even managing uh, their own lives, ultimately. My early graduate career was in research methodology, uh, mostly within the context of international systems. But I do have a great respect for um, developing a forecasting methodology. It's an area, a uh, significant area of the field, and uh, one that should be uh, presented even in an introductory context. So we have that. And uh, again, drawing upon the work of other significant individuals, uh, colleagues in the field, uh, we go through the six pillars of future studies. Uh, thank you, Sohail and Ayatollah. Uh, emerging Issues Analysis, which is a, uh, call it a, to me a basic methodology, one that is essential uh, in the field as a great point of uh, departure for us. Generational Analysis, understanding that the worlds that uh, the millennial is born into uh, versus the, uh, the boomer or the, even the Xer is considerably different. Uh, and, uh, we are, we are shaped by the experiences and the worlds that we were born into. So it, it's good to look at that. Uh, demographics is one of those areas where we can have reasonable assurance, uh, reasonable confidence that um, we can, you know, I hate to use the word predict, but we have a great deal of confidence on uh, population uh, trends uh, and then combined with migration analysis and other things, we can see where uh, we are getting into a more homogeneous world and uh, what that portends for us uh, in, in broad cultural terms. Uh, and then causal layered analysis again. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Inayatullah. Uh, and one which uh, works very well, and I often uh, frame it as a an anthropological dig where you're going into the deeper layers of culture and uh, these deep um, almost unconscious levels of uh, world views and uh, the myths and metaphors that we employ to make sense of the world. 
The last element uh, that I introduced in this particular course was the quantum theory of social change, and again, one that I'm very much taken up with and uh, have really begun to employ and apply uh, in a variety of ways in terms of a worldview, because uh, most of us have been really completely immersed in a Newtonian view, a very mechanistic view of uh, the world works. And uh, it's only relatively recently, really within the last generation or so, that we start to understand that the world is really more a quantum world than it is a smooth trend line or a, a mechanism. Things can appear and disappear. Things can change literally in an instant. And, uh, and then the world is completely different. Uh, it works very well when you can use this to... You know, one of the metaphors that I use is uh, the idea of waves. Again, maybe this is my experience living in Hawaii for 12 years, but uh, the metaphor of surfing um, is used by myself and several others, I should add, uh, as a way of understanding that as a futurist or as one who uh, begins to employ a, a futures mindset, it, it works very well in terms of managing your own life because uh, you start to see these ideas of waves and being able to surf those waves. So no wave is identical to another, but once you have the basic skill set to surf, you can surf virtually any wave uh, depending upon um, your, your courage in, in a sense. The, uh, so, so we get that discussion of forecasting methods. You know, we, we de definitely want to drive that home. But I do conclude with this exciting area of the quantum nature of technological change and uh, how you, we end up with this social lag. Uh, I call it, to me, that's the true future shock. The future shock is a kind of, uh, it's a dis-ease, you know, literally a dis-ease with the acceleration of history and uh, it explains a lot of this fleeing back and nostalgia. By the way, the word nostalgia is literally, when you break it down, also a disease. Uh, like neuralgia, nostalgia is a disease. Um, so it's that seeking for a golden age that never existed. Uh, it's a kind of um, Freudian death wish, you know, a return to the womb. Uh, we seem to be very much in that uh, mode as we see the, the world changing so quickly around us. Uh, so it's, it's good to kind of point that out, that uh, future shock is a real thing. We're all, to a greater or lesser extent, uh, wrapped up in it. But it's good to know that it's out there so that you can recognize it when you see it. So I think it's a great place uh, to conclude any given uh, course or workshop uh, at the introductory level in future studies. So again, uh, thank you so much for uh, staying with us all the way to this point. And uh, I will perhaps put out one or two other um, little video lecturettes on um, course design. But this one, I really wanted to uh, give that special focus to the field of future studies and uh, outline how I would, again, in a bare bones way, and in a way that can allow you know, those so interested to pick and choose and, and engage um, the uh, individual elements that might be of particular interest and one that they can, I believe, parley into a, one heck of a course. So uh, thanks so much. I look forward to comments. And uh, you're always welcome to do so. Thanks again.